The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, curses, hexes, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep that results from listening to this podcast. This is the Scream Kings podcast. I'm Max George. And I'm Nathaniel Darkish. Your podcasts follow you. They never leave. They live with you. <gasps> oh, this movie's so good. Yes. Uh, so today we are talking about the 2020, uh, I, guess, I guess it's a Netflix original, technically? I don't know. Netflix it, masterpiece. Yes. Uh, His House. Directed by Remy Weeks it is his uh, first film, his his directorial debut, and man, we just we we're excited to dive into this movie. Yeah, it, this I mean, twenty twenty was a pretty shitty year for everybody, and especially for film. A lot of our you know really exciting shows that we were looking forward to got pushed back into twenty twenty one, and who knows how far they'll get pushed back even more. Well, I mean, we're we're getting Saint Maud like this week, Ugh. so I'm excited about that. Oh, so am I. You have no idea. We might have to go to a theater. <laughs> Probably not. I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> this movie, however, I have the audacity to say was the best horror of 2020 and the best horror I've seen probably since Hereditary, Nathaniel. I've got good things to say about his house. As do I. It's a very impressive movie. I'm I really really like it a lot. And so we usually forego, you know, saying, you know, if you don't want spoilers, then don't listen to the episode yet. But like let's let's just reemphasize it this time. Uh there is a really important kind of twist component component to the story that will really ruin uh, I think a lot of the first time viewing experience for this movie. So if you are interested in this movie at all, and we highly recommend that you do become interested if you weren't already. Pause the episode, watch the movie on Netflix, and then come back. We'll we'll be here. You'll be really missing out on a really great horror experience if you don't watch it first. So, you know, do that and then come back if if you haven't already watched it. So, yeah, this movie is one of those horror movies that I think hits harder if you don't know a ton about it. So I hope people who are listening, if you are interested in watching this movie, please take this spoiler warning seriously. It's an incredible plot twist, and you'll want to fully appreciate it without us ruining it. But if you don't care about spoilers, and you love hearing our voice without pausing and watching a horror movie, (laughs) by all means, continue on, because we have so many good things to say about his house. I saw something in the dark. You have felt it too. You're having problems with the puppy. This is what they want. They like to see us crazy. Ah! <laughs> Let them send us back. How quickly you forget. Everything we went through to get here. Do you want to give us a real quick rundown of this movie before we just dive into all of the goodness? Yes. So this movie is about two refugees who are Sudanese. Uh, It is a couple. Uh, Their names are Bol and Rial. And they have escaped war-torn Sudan. Uh, and have arrived in uh, the UK. They, very early in the film, are you know, moved from a refugee camp to some you know, government-sponsored housing. And in their new apartment, though, very quickly, things start to seem a little bit less than right. Uh, they appear to have brought something from Sudan, something supernatural, 
with them, something that is upset about them being there in the UK. And as the story progresses, we soon find out that this couple, Rial and Bull, lost what appears to be their daughter on the way over to England from Sudan. And so a lot of the supernatural entities that are manifesting to both of them kind of take on that appearance, almost as if this daughter didn't actually die, but her dark spirit is out for revenge. And again, as the story progresses, you kind of see Bull and Rial separate into two different worlds where Rial wants to hold on to her culture um, and believes in all of these dark stories of the Night Witch or an Apeth who has come to seek revenge on them. And then you have Bull, who is trying very hard to assimilate, um, to not really bring up any red flags for the English government so that they can kind of settle in and become formal refugees. And essentially, we find out that the supernatural entity is very real. And the big plot twist comes. I think we should share the plot twist a little bit later when we can give it some more time. Um, and ultimately, Bull and Rial have to fight this Apeth together and and come out on top of it. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's only because they uh, come at it as a unified front, ultimately, that they're able, able to overcome this, you know, supernatural evil. So it's... So yeah, let's let's jump into to some of these kind of major components that that we really liked about the film, which uh, is going to be the majority of our discussion. We we both really like this movie, and I think the first and foremost for for me as a horror aficionado is uh, how original the story was, but also felt so familiar. I think Nathaniel, we are so inundated with you know whitewashed horror movies nowadays, and I mean. We live in the United States, that's kind of our cultural reference. It makes sense, but having the Sudanese supernatural story displayed so well and so effortlessly was incredibly refreshing. And I think it aided its terror because we didn't really know what this monster was. We had no preconceived notions of what it would do. Was it a demon? Was it a ghost? Or was it something entirely different? And that... That was fun. We need more of that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I feel like a lot of the horror that I've consumed recently that has been more international in flavor has really uh, stuck with me in, in a much bigger way than a lot of the more familiar trappings of you know American films. This film is uh, a British film but you know because it is pulling sudanese culture and is looking at like this idea of what it means to be a refugee and live in this new place and things like that and and is really you know kind of looking at how these cultures are meshing and also clashing uh it it really makes this film feel very fresh and and you know i i just referenced that you know there are other horror movies that i feel like have done a really good job of this kind same kind of thing uh, so I just wanted to kind of briefly mention a couple of those here because, you know, if if you liked this movie, you're probably looking for something that has, you know, probably not the same flavor exactly, but, you know, something that, that feels less familiar and tropey uh, than uh, a lot of the the stuff that we see coming out of Hollywood. Not that the stuff out of Hollywood isn't great. A lot of it is. It's just that, you know, it's nice to have something that is totally different. Recently, probably the biggest one that, that's jumping out to uh, in my mind lately is the movie Under the Shadow, uh, which is Iranian. It is set in Iran uh, just before the cultural revolution that, that shifted power back to the very much, you know, super hyper ridiculously conservative Muslim government. You know, it's, we see that period of transition and we get to see a sort of haunting story that is very unique to Iran in that one. So that one's definitely a, a film that's jumping to my mind that, you know, feels very much of its culture. Um, another one that I really appreciate, and we ranted in the best of ways about this movie, was Wreck, the Spanish flick about, you know, the demon plague, legion, whatever we want to call it. Well, demon not zombies. Similar... Uh, demon zombies, sure. Um, well, not inherently, you know, an original story. I think the backdrop of having it in a foreign country 
really added to its scare factor because it was unfamiliar for, you know, viewers to some regard. And it, it was just another opportunity for foreign filmmakers to get some notoriety. I think Hollywood is so focused on what's making money and what we're used to seeing that some of these other spectacular films are forgotten almost. Or, or I feel like what happens is it gets remade, repackaged, and, and you know, Americanized for an American audience. And, and, like, sometimes that works out. The Ring, for example, I think is a fantastic movie that's definitely p- taking the original Asian film and, and still, like, staying true to a lot of the, the Asian-ness of it. You know, the Japanese feel, ideas, and how the horror works. And the, that sort of kind of like nightmarish quality that is very unique to a lot of Japanese horror. And other times it doesn't work. You know, we, we had a whole slew of uh, Asian horror movies getting repackaged for American audiences during that period of time because of the success of The Ring. And I, I felt like a lot of times the story ended up feeling very inauthentic or just, you know, kind of meh. In, in comparison to the original content, which which I think is a shame because, you know, I think audiences are a lot smarter and, and more willing to kind of go with you on some weird, unusual journeys because the content is good, regardless of the, the cultural differences and things like that. You know, a, a good audience is going to appreciate a good movie regardless of... You know, the the differences in culture between Americans and, you know, some other culture or, or whatever. People like good story at the end of the day, regardless of the form it takes. And not only good storytelling, but I think another aspect of this movie that made it so intriguing was how relevant it was. Um, it's a refugee story, and the United States has been dealing with a lot of refugee problems, not with refugees themselves, but our government and how to handle them. For well, the last four years. <laughs> and hopefully that and s- changes in a huge way. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, we won't go into that horror movie. But to see this kind of on a worldwide level, I think was really important. We've been through a lot of crap in the last four years in the United States. And so to see the same problems existing outside of our little sphere was really kind of harrowing. That This isn't just an American problem. It's a worldwide problem. Um, and what a great genre to explore this in. You know, horror has the opportunity to really pair the supernatural with the realistic. Um, and I, I think his house did that so delicately and just executed it so well. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And and I like that it shows us this kind of refugee experience. And, like, it's not all bad and it's not all good. It's it's complicated. It's, it's morally ambiguous in a lot yes. of ways. You know, yes, there is the strong, horrific component of it that is, you know, certainly bad. But a lot of their experiences with people aren't bad or good. Um, you know, we, we have a, a scene where Rial is trying to find her way around town and she like runs into some punk teenagers who like make fun of her and give her a bunch of vague directions that all disagree with each other and kind of treat her like garbage. But you know, that's not everyone's experience though. Um, And that's not always like the kind of thing that they're experiencing when, you know, they're going out into the community. Like bowl has a really positive experience going to a pub very early on. And like, he's able to connect with people and like, seeing some ridiculous drinking songs, cheering for a, a soccer game on TV, and, and like, you know, it's it's not necessarily, like, what they're used to, but it's not bad, but it's also, say, you know, doesn't say that uh, the culture that they came from is inherently bad. You know, yes, they got out of there because of war, but there's still a lot of things that they are very close to in terms of, like, their identity as people. So I, I like that it wasn't just, like, Sudan bad, uh, UK good, or you know, or or it didn't say UK bad, Sudan good. You know, it was it, much more complicated than all of that, which I thought was very honest and refreshing. Well, and it was something that would speak to many different people. I watched the movie with two individuals, one of whom, you know, was very much on the side of Rial, saying, "Oh, you know, don't forget your culture, don't." 
do anything to hamper the culture. You know, it was very pro-Sudan, as you were saying. Um, and then I watched it with another individual who was kind of flipped, like very pro-UK. Like, the government is providing you with housing to make your life better. Don't break the rules. You know, assimilate yourself. Uh, and so like you say, Nathaniel, I think it delicately shows both sides of the spectrum. But more importantly, it shows the middle ground of how this is not a black or white topic. And it's so more complicated than we we think, especially people of privilege who've never had to deal with these problems. Absolutely. And and along those lines, I, I like that, you know, it's it's not until we see both of these ideas merge together in a meaningful way that they're able to overcome the big obstacle. You know, it's it's not until they are united as opposed to being divided in how they are approaching the, you know, monster problem, the apath, that they're able to to resolve that. It, it kind of also is mirroring their experience of adjusting to life in the UK. You know, it's not until they kind of merge these two ideas of, hey, we need to take parts of where we're from and parts of this new place and find a, a nice middle ground that they are able to also change that experience for, for them uh, and, you know, have a, have a better more meaningful life moving forward. That's that's excellent. And I, I think as we talk about that, let's maybe shift directions to talk about the monsters of this film. Yeah. And if we haven't convinced you that this is an amazing movie up to this point, then buckle in and put your big boy pants on, because here we go. So the main entity of the movie is what's called an apeth, which I have done as much research as I possibly can do and not have found hardly anything. Uh, but in the movie, uh, Rial kind of tells us that the Apeth, or a Night Witch, is a Sudanese kind of witch akin to a skinwalker who is summoned when revenge is required type of a thing. It, it's a very malevolent entity that kind of consumes all that it touches. Kind of superior to the Apeth, or Apeth, I don't know how I say it. If someone knows the true pronunciation listening, please reach out to me on Twitter. We see kind of these harrowing ghosts of the people who did not survive the trip from Sudan. Um, primarily, Bolin Rial's daughter, Nyaglak. Um, and Nathaniel, the practical effects here and the costuming was terrifying. These masks that these drowned victims were wearing are very spooky. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really like the visuals. I, I I wasn't as spooked as it sounds like you were, but I really liked the visuals. I really liked how everything looked, how everything felt. I, I was very impressed by the aesthetic that the film presented, especially just yeah, in the context of horror. And I want to maybe specify a little bit more that they... While the masks were spooky and these practical effects were very well developed, I was more scared by the Apeth itself. There's a scene in particular where Bull has kind of had enough of these hauntings, he wants to confront whatever this thing is, and he does a, a almost like a hypnotism session, I would imagine, a seance involving just himself, um, yeah. and he, he talks to the Apeth for the first time, and he has a little candle in the house that he's kind of using as a focus, and it turns into a bonfire. And then he appears to be on some sort of beach, talking to the Apeth through the fire. And all you can see are these two kind of glowing irises. You know they're irises, but they're too far away. So they're just kind of these haunting eyes in the darkness that are talking to him. Yeah, it's, and, it's almost like, like when you see like a cat. <sighs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it's like. And someone who has had some sleep paralysis, and I believe I've talked about my lovely monster that I saw back in the day, oh, yeah. um, seeing these red eyes in the darkness and not fully understanding what was, what was there, whew, it, it kind of shook me a little bit. I, it was one of those moments where I felt like I needed to burn some white sage or sprinkle some holy water in my house or do something, which... Is pretty impressive for me. Movies don't tend to do that for Max anymore. And then we, we get the full visual of the Apeth towards the end, and it's not some cloven hooved monster, it's not a boogeyman esque. It, it looks monstrous, but it also 
is very human, which was unsettling as well, because as we'll soon get to, the true horrors of this movie are what Bull and Rial did to get to England. Yes. Uh, do we want to talk about that now? Before we move on, I just want to say the last monster I really, really loved was the actual house that these two were staying in. I love it when horror movies make inanimate objects such a uh, main character of the film. And I really felt that the house started to suffocate these two and take on a malevolence of its own. Um, and it never was said, or there wasn't anything really to make it feel like it was alive. But that house was definitely a main character, a main monster. <laughs> it was great. Absolutely. And and I think that's very true to kind of how we interact with buildings, especially homes. Like, when we live in a building, like, it becomes familiar. The sounds, the random creaks, the little, you know, water moving through the pipes, all of that feels like something that you interact with. It feels like it's it's almost like the personality of the place. And so making the house itself such a strong character in the film was, a I, I feel, a, a deliberate choice. I mean, it is called His House, and I felt like it, it did such a, a tremendous job of, of doing that and, and showing us some really interesting visuals with how, how the house goes, especially uh, those scenes where Ball, you know, kind of in, in his uh, pursuit of you know, the Apeth or Yagak's ghost or whatever, you know, he when he was trying to figure that all out, as, you know, he, he starts to do a lot of damage to the house as it as it currently is. You know, he, he tears up a lot of wallpaper, he starts tearing holes in walls, he starts doing all that kind of stuff. And and it shows just how broken the house is, even though you know, on the surface it looked fine, you know, a little dirty and grungy, but you know, as a whole, pretty structurally sound, and then you very quickly see that that is, in fact, not the case. It, it has this sort of facade, which, again, I think is a, a very deliberate symbol that's being used in the film. You know, it's showing us that, you know, this is the, uh, you know, shelter and protection and, you know, good that is being offered to refugees, but it actually isn't as... as uh, clean and shiny and beautiful as we like to pretend it is. Well, and I think it adds to another thematic element of the movie is that we are constantly rooting for both Rial and Bull. Neither of them really seem to be an antagonist nor a protagonist. They always kind of seem to be at odds with each other, um, looking for their own purpose in this refugee situation, trying to hold on to their culture and also trying to move on and assimilate as best they can. And at parts, I think I, I wanted to root for Bull more. You know, you've been offered this beautiful gift, like, take advantage of that. And then at other times, I was rooting for Rial more, like, do not lose your heritage, don't become whitewashed. And so, like you were saying, I think that was kind of a message when you were talking at the beginning of the episode about how this refugee system is so nuanced it's okay to want both. It's okay to want to kind of feel like you are now a part of something bigger while holding on to your culture. And I thought that was a beautiful theme. You can root, you know, doing something bad doesn't make a bad person. All right, Nathaniel, I think you should be the one to tell us about the plot twist, because when it happened, I got several all-capital messages from you. It was amazing. Yes. This this plot twist affected me in, in a way that I didn't expect it to. So when we are reaching the, the climax of this film and, and the threat of the Apath has really become ever-present in the house, and you know, not and, and on top of all of that, uh, we had an instance where Bull uh, went and talked to the government people to say, "Hey, we just need to get, get into a different house. Like, there's something wrong with the house." And and they come to the house because of that and see that he has torn up the walls, and they're like, "Um, yeah, you might get kicked out, and like, we don't want you to, but." There might not be any other choice. Like, you might get kicked out. You might get sent back to Sudan, which would, you know, not be good for, for them at all. Right after that is when he has his biggest kind of confrontation with the past. 
And on top of that, we also have, you know, Rial looking at the past as well. Like, both of them are thinking about it, and so then we get to see it visually, which, by the way, absolutely stunning. Especially there's, like, a, a scene, just like a, a, a moment where Bull is, like, eating uh, at a table, and then it, like, pans out, and suddenly, like, it's in the middle of the ocean. And it was seamless and brilliant, so that was amazing. Well, and I think that was foreshadowing of what was coming. Like, you have Bull just doing something so simple as eating his breakfast, and then as the camera kind of pans out, you see that there's this whole other catastrophe and pandemonium happening inside of him, and we soon find out that... So so we, we get to see them escaping Sudan. The conflict has come to their village... There was a massacre at the school that Riel worked at, and Bull finds her hiding in a cupboard. And and then they like start, you know, kind of making their way out of the town. They're you know hiding on rooftops, this and that. And, and the whole time you're kind of like, where's their daughter? Where's Niagak? And finally, they reach this uh, bus that is only letting people on really if they are you know women and children, or if you know you're like. The, the father of, of, of a child or something like that. And so Rial gets led into the bus, but Bull does not. And so in a panic, what he does is he picks up this little, or this, like, I don't know, early teenage girl, maybe? I don't I, I can't really place the age of Niagak. Anyways, he picks her up and he says, oh, I'm a father, let me in, let me in. And they do. And so Niagak's mother... You know, because Bol and Rial are not her parents, is screaming for her. She's, you know, screaming her name as this bus then drives away. So, yeah, they straight up kidnapped this daughter of theirs so they could escape. And it's absolutely harrowing to realize that. Like, I lost my mind. I could not handle it. That was the most horrific thing in the film way more than anything else. So. I was just going to say, I, I a thousand percent agree with you. And it, it was a combination of the horrific act of kidnapping on top of them trying to look out for themselves, on top of Niaglak then screaming for her mother as the camera shows us the mom chasing after this van trying to get her daughter back, on top of them then losing Niaglak in the trip to England, like it just it takes your breath away in the worst ways, and it's just haunting. It, it completely raises the stakes of the movie and makes it so much more intense. But at the same time, you're still rooting for Bull and Rial. I don't think of them as villains. They did a terrible thing, but again, like the beauty of this movie is once again showing us that it's much more complicated than just being kidnappers. Yeah, and and it's not like they just did it for kicks and giggles or, you know, for, you know, any of the typical reasons that someone typically commits an act of, of kidnapping. In this case, you know, it was literally the only way that he could keep himself alive. And that is harrowing in and of itself, too. Like, it was doing a bad thing to get out of an unspeakably bad situation. And so what I like is that the film lets us stew in that awfulness of that action. And you realize, like, why Niagak's death haunts them as much as it does. Why they can't let it go. Why why it's all they can think about. And and you see exactly what Bowl is trying to run from as he's just trying to pretend like, oh, well, we're just perfectly British now, everything is fine. Like, you, you understand that mentality, and you also understand why Niall is still stuck in Sudan, because she feels like maybe she should still be. Because there there really is no good reason for them to have gotten on that bus. You know, not a, a good moral right reason. You know, they had to do something awful to get on. And so... It, it recontextualizes a lot of their guilt and their, especially their survivors or survivors guilt. And, but it doesn't say that they're monsters. They did something monstrous, but it doesn't mean that they are bad people necessarily. It means that they are people who did what they had to do, 
even if it was monstrous. And they have to find a way to move forward from that. And, you know, yeah, how do, how do you do that? that? That is the real, like, weight of the film. And I, I loved it because it is so hard to, to make a real, like, judgment call about it. Yes, that is a horrifying thing that they did, but that's not, like, the end of the conversation. Well, and I think, in some regards, we find out that it's not Rial versus Bull or Bull versus Rial. That night witch, the Apeth, kind of becomes that, that monstrous tragedy that they have done. And how do you resolve that? How do you move on from trauma, to some regard? Mm-hmm. How do you move on from your bad choices? How do you move on from your horrible choices? And I, again, I think the theme of the movie now switches to it's not about assimilating, it's not about holding on to the past, it's about having loved ones there with you and getting through life together and not separate or isolated. Uh, and it turns it's a moment of true horror, Nathaniel. I think when we see Niaglak getting kidnapped, it's one of those horrific moments in the horror genre that just leaves you feeling so scared. And then the movie kind of turns it on its head and said, yes, that was horrific, but something beautiful can come out of that. I don't know. It, it just it turned from a horror movie into a piece of poetic literature to some regard. And it was done so delicately. It wasn't forcing anything down our mouths. It was just, this happens. This is human existence. And what do you do with that? How do you reconcile that? How do you move forward? Nobody really knows. But if we move forward together with people, it's not as bad. And maybe we don't have to be as scared of the dark. I love that, you know, it also doesn't necessarily give us any clear answers. It's not like suddenly everything was magical and wonderful and they all high-fived and hugged and everything was good. It's not that simple. Life doesn't suddenly become easy. They still have to live with what they do. And, And that actually... Um, is, you know, that final image of the film. It's this them living with all of these ghosts now. They have to live with them. They have to look at them every day and know that that is part of their lives. You know, all of these people who died on that journey or died in their village or died... And and I like that, yeah, also, all these ghosts aren't necessarily, like, even Sudanese. Like, most of them are. They look, Most of them look Sudanese. But some of them, you know, like, it's it's harder to say if they're from that same area. They have to live with that and live with these deaths and live with that heritage. And they have to press on. And, and, like, the only way to deal with trauma is to look at it. The only way to recognize that, like, you've done something bad is to acknowledge it. And so they have to do that every day in their lives. And it's only by doing that, instead of hiding from it and closing your eyes and turning away from it, that they are able to move on. And I think that's what makes the ending so powerful to me, is because it it almost seems that Rial is on the side of the Apeth and Mm -hmm. wants it to kill Bull, but at the very last minute, she kind of has this change of heart. And normally in horror movies, these moments of, you know, a character all of a sudden shifting and helping out or having these change of heart, it doesn't feel natural it feels contrived and it feels like a plot element but this movie real's decision to help bold defeat their past and defeat this trauma was so moving and so powerful and i'm getting a little emotional (laughs) thinking about it right now because that's that's human existence is we are so nuanced and revenge and anger and hatred can disappear when loved ones are in danger and facing things that maybe we had a part of creating. Absolutely. And, you know, I I 100% agree that that ending works, you know, them defeating the Apath, but I don't think it would have worked if we didn't have that scene that came immediately after it, where we then see them having patched up the house as best they can, the government people coming and saying, okay, you know what, like, we're just going to call it a warning, have a good day, move on with your lives, keep keep adjusting. And then we get to see the ghosts around them and see them looking at the ghosts. I, I feel like we needed that denouement 
to show us the impact of that. Because otherwise, it it, it would have been hard to, to say clearly if, if her action in them defeating the Apath was uh, the right call for the ending. But because we then get to see how it still is affecting their lives, but they've taken it's taken on a new shape in their lives, that was what made that ending work for me. I, I couldn't agree more with you, and I think... You know, I had a question in our notes about should the Apeth should have won. And I don't think that that would have felt natural in this movie. I think a lot of horror movies out there use monsters, use demons, use witches as very figurative monsters and enemies and antagonists that need to be destroyed. And so I I tend to like it when the evil wins, you know, it's something different, something cool. Uh, but in a movie like His House, it wasn't so much about the Apeth as it was Bull and Rial kind of accepting what they had done and moved on. Um, the monster became a secondary character, and so its defeat served a purpose. It wasn't just heroes, you know, winning and being champions of the movie. It, it was human nature and the human ability to let go of the horrible things we've done. And and what better way to get rid of monsters, you know? I found very philosophical all of a sudden, but that's because this movie had a message that resonates so beautifully, I think. And another thing that we just have in the notes is just, you know, that, that cinematography, which I, I referenced, you know, just with that one particular scene. But yeah, the visuals in this movie really work tremendously well. It, it, it's, it's, it's amazing to see how certain scenes blended the the past and the present you know blended war torn sudan with you know their apartment in england and that was absolutely stunning to me to look at and i wrote four words down i think to kind of sum up what i feel about his house and the four words are it's unique it's captivating it's heartbreaking and it's terrifying um if you're looking for a good horror movie Watch His House on Netflix. As I said earlier, it is the best horror film I saw in 2020, and I think it will win awards. I hope it wins awards. We know how the Academy feels about horror movies, but... There's one last thing I, I wanted to highlight that I don't think we had in our notes. It's just the, the level of the performances of everybody. Oh, I'm glad you brought this up. I'm glad you brought this up. <laughs> because I... So, um, Bowl is played by... I'm probably going to butcher his name, but uh, Sope Dirisu. Then Rial is played by uh, Wunmi Mosaku, uh, who is also in Lovecraft Country, by the way. Yeah, Niagak is uh, Mylika Wakoli Abagaba. Uh, Matt Smith is in it as one of the government guys. Uh, Mark Esworth, you know, he's uh, one of the titular doctors who? Who what? Nathaniel, who what? <laughs> I couldn't resist. Oh, <laughs> and, and, I couldn't resist. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> oh, and then and then the you know very creepy Apath is played by uh, Javier Botet, who by the way is in so many horror movies as a monster. So that was fun too, including the uh, like emaciated, creepy looking lady from Wreck. And it, he was the lovely hobo that we loved so much. <laughs> he's the crooked man in the second Conjuring movie. He's he's just does a lot of cool creature work. He's he's a cool actor. So I was just gonna say, what an amazing job to have! It's just you are the monster in the movie. It'd be so yeah. fun. Yeah, between like he's also him... Mama and Mama. That's pretty cool. Nice. Yeah, between like him and Doug. Jones? Doug? I think it's Doug Jones. I think it's his name. Yeah, Doug Jones. Like, they're they're basically like all of the monsters in horror. And they're both tremendously good at it. So, but yeah, like, all of their performances, absolutely killer. Really sold it. Really felt like the strong emotional beats, their reactions, like, the those, those, their reaction shots, especially, just really sold me on their terror and their or, or they're trying to, like, bury things deep inside. Like, it really made the film work. So, anyways, props to all of them. They were amazingly good. Should we maybe try and nitpick something about the movie? <laughs> so you have down pacing question mark, which 
I, I do have to agree that there were certain scenes, especially earlier on, that maybe just went on a little bit too long. Uh, the The best example I can think of is just uh, the the scene where Niall is trying to navigate the village and is you know kind of feeling all turned around and all of that. I felt like that scene was maybe about I don't know twenty five percent too long. Like there's there's a few scenes yeah kind of early on that, that felt just a little bit draggy, but other than that. It was pretty killer across the board. Like, I have very little to say negative about this movie. Yeah, uh, when I said pacing, I agree with you there, Nathaniel. I think it was more pacing of individual scenes that kind of started to lose my interest just a hair. But as a movie as a whole, the pacing was definitely well done. I just think a few scenes had a little bit of dead air here and there that maybe could have been fixed. But that's being very critical. Yeah, and I guess the only other thing I would say is that, like, I wouldn't have minded if it was a little bit scarier. Like I said, like, to me, like, the visuals were very creepy, but it didn't necessarily scare me very much. And so, you know, if if it had thrown a, a little bit more intensity in some of the scares, outside of that, you know, gut punch of, of the human, you know, of, of the awful thing that they did being uh, real-life horror, yeah, other than that, nothing bad to say about it. So, uh, do you want to move on to ratings? Yes, please. All right. So, uh, as I as I just suggested, it, it wasn't the scariest movie in the world for me. So, uh, screams wise, I only gave it five. I gave it a seven, but I think I had some life experience that I felt radiate through this movie that hit me a little bit harder. In particular, the Apeth kind of looking into the darkness that. That reminded me of very not great moments of my life. So I gave it a 7. Alright, and then crowns-wise, I gave it a very solid 9. Yes, same. I want to give it a 10, but I feel like I have to wait for that moment of pure, ineffable, ineffable, I don't know, horror radiance to give a 10. So 9. But like a 9.8. This movie is a masterpiece. Fair enough. Yeah, it it really is a near perfect movie in in so many ways. And oh, you have a note that it has a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. That is awesome. That it does, and I feel like Rotten Tomatoes is the most stingy of all of the rating categories. So to get a hundred is a pretty impressive accomplishment. That and uh, Host got a hundred percent last year, both of which are great movies. So, so do you want to tell us a little bit more about Apeths in the Occult Corner? Yes, welcome to the Occult Corner. Um, First off, I want to kind of pitch it to everyone who listens to the show and follows us on Twitter and Instagram. Um, Doing research about the Apeth and Dinka lore in particular, which is the predominant culture of the Sudanese people, there is hardly anything out there not related to his house. I was trying to look for sources that didn't have anything to do with the movie, and I found maybe one or two research papers on Dinka culture which mention Apeths. So please, if anyone listening to the show knows a lot about these, reach out to us. I will love you forever because this is my jam. So an Apeth in Dinka lore is very similar, like I mentioned earlier, to somewhat of a skinwalker in American Indian lore. It's a witch predominantly, and in particular called a night witch, that is tasked with some form of revenge. In the movie itself, Rial recounts a story about a thief and how this night witch kind of comes after the thief. And kind of two things that were really predominant in the movie that actually I think was a symbol for what the night witches are capable of was the the element of night. It is a night witch. It operates, of course, when the sun goes down. However, as you watch his house, it's really fun because all of the monsters and the ghouls really don't appear in the daylight. It's always at night. And they're also affecting the light of the house. So whenever Bull is trying to fix the electricity, it doesn't seem to work or it seems to fail the next day. The Apeth is kind of making sure that darkness prevails in the house, which was really cool. And then a second thing is that the Night Witch, when it curses someone in Dinka culture, it uses something very common, kind of in the African Mediterranean area, is the evil eye, which is a curse you put on someone 
to have bad luck or to curse them with sickness. I'm sure you've seen kind of the blue and white eyes if you've ever been to a metaphysical store, an occult store, or even just they're very common in popular culture. Um, this is supposed to be a talisman to ward off the evil eye. There's also like like gestures that you can make to ward off the evil eye. It talks about that a lot in the Dracula novel. But they don't really talk about this in the movie per se. However, I was reading one article that was talking about the Apeth in conjunction with his house. Um, it was talking about that the evil eye presented itself not you know, in the typical way we think, but in all of the leers and jeers from the neighbors. You had that really kind of creepy old lady who was always staring down Bull and Rial, and you had the nurse who was kind of giving her the kind of shady eye as well. And I, again, I just thought that was part of the delicacy of this movie in taking Dinka culture and blending it into this movie without shoving it down her throats and saying, this is an apeth. This is what they do. It's just very well done. And I want to learn more. So if you have any information about Dinka witchcraft or Dinka culture, Dinka occultism, please reach out to us. I will be forever grateful. Well, time-wise, we might be able to squeeze in a B-Real game. What do you think? Let's do it. All right. So following my established pattern, the song title that this B-Real game is named after is Spiderwebs. Oh, good hell. All right, so... Our... Hold on, where's my alcohol? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're definitely going to want to take a shot before this one. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm, I'm batting one for one. One and one. Our first film is Itsy Bitsy, coming to us from ni- or sorry, from uh, 2019. Based on the centuries-old poem, a family moves into a secluded mansion where they soon find themselves being targeted by an entity taking the form of a giant spider. Overall rating, 4.9 out of 10. And uh, the review gives no specific rating, but says, I was on the spider side until he killed the cat. I wasn't on Team Spider after that. (laughs) I'm a big fan of horror movie silliness. One example is how the horror events are initiated here. An African uh, uh, guy arrives uninvited to the house of the widower of a woman that helped him during his childhood. It's basically... That guy is saying something like, I owe your wife a lot, so to repay my debt to her, I bring you this gift. A huge spider that will start killing people off randomly and make your life miserable. Alright, so that is our first movie, Itsy Bitsy. The the second movie is Trapdoor Spider from Hell. Coming to us from 1997. In Chernobyl, a trapdoor spider is mutated by radiation to grow to an immense size and begins to build traps around the Ukrainian countryside. Capturing the okay, entire pause, vehicles. Nathaniel. I just need to bask in the glory that I don't know what I was even thinking was coming, but Trapdoor Spider from Hell, starting in Russia in Chernobyl, was not where my mind was. Oh, yes. Keep going. Oh, uh, capturing entire vehicles and killing innocents. Now the question is, can the local militia take it out before it starts to lay eggs? Overall rating, 3.7 out of 10. But the review gives it 7 out of 10. Finally, a movie with trapdoor spiders. Seriously, I'm tired of every spider movie just being about tarantulas or spiders with webs. Trapdoor spiders are way scarier, and the CGI was honestly ahead of its time. About a thousand times better than arachnophobia. Whoa. Alright. Someone's being feisty. All right, and then the last film, Earth vs. the Spider, from 2001. Dear Satan, please save my soul tonight. (laughs) Oh, you haven't even heard this description. Buckle up. (laughs) A shy, obsessive comic book fan gets injected with an experimental serum from a lab that is studying how to give humans the abilities of spiders. At first, he develops minor abilities, such as increased strength, which allows him to fight local criminals and bullies, thus living out his dream of being a superhero and impressing his attractive next-door neighbor. Things start to get more odd when he's able to shoot webs out of his abdomen. Then he loses control over the force with which he applies his increasingly deadly abilities, as well as his judgment to discern between criminals and jokesters. His dream becomes a nightmare when he grows large uh, spider body parts, is in constant pain, 
and develops a nearly insatiable hunger. A detective with a traumatized wife begins investigating when bodies covered in cobwebs and spider venom start piling up. Overall rating, 4.3 out of 10. And the review gives it a 9 out of 10. Wow. Echoes of Greatness. This may not be the best film ever, but the writing and direction manages to be fresh around every bend. You expect a lot of dumb dumb noise swell scares, cheesy one-liners, etc., but you'll find none of that here. Just good old-fashioned horror, alive and well. Although this movie isn't the most involved or beautiful film you'll ever see, give it a chance. Do I have to pick which one doesn't really exist? Yes. So one of these is not a real movie. Is it Itsy Bitsy, The Trapdoor Spider from Hell, or Earth vs. The Spider? I do not have a lot backing this decision other than I love to learn about spiders. I hate them. I don't want them anywhere near me. But they are fascinating creatures, and trapdoor spiders are horrific. Mm-hmm. So that one, I don't think that's the real one. You're right! Ugh, 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 ugh. I was almost going to say the Spider-Man one, but that sounds so... Like, Marvel is just so built into our zeitgeist, I can imagine someone ripping it off. And I've actually seen the Itsy Bitsy one in my horror cues, so I knew that one was not the right one. Okay. Well. (laughs) Thousand points to Ravenclaw! Now, after this is done, I'm gonna just... we'll, We'll let the episode finish, but everyone should watch the trailer for Earth vs. the Spider. Guess who is in that movie? No, oh, no. William Defoe. I'll give you a hint. Nicholas you Cage. Ref- <laughs> you referred to him as a beefcake. <gasps> no. <laughs> Dan Aykroyd is this detective with the traumatized wife who begins investigating when bodies are covered in cobwebs and spider venom start piling up. I now must must find this movie and watch it. It sounds seriously amazing. the the trailer had me in tears on the floor laughing. So it does sound like the most amazing bad B movie ever made. So you know, just throwing that out there for everyone who loves them a bad movie. That one might be the pinnacle of it. Is it World versus the Spider? Earth versus Earth. the Spider? Earth versus the Spider. Well, I have it queued up in my YouTube once we wrap this show up. Good, because it is a masterpiece. All right, Nathaniel, how are you staying spooky? Uh, Lately, I have gotten into another horror podcast, which is probably not a good idea based on how many I already listen to. But, eh, whatever. Anyways, it's called The King Cast. It is a Stephen King-specific one, and uh, usually in any given episode... Uh, the hosts plus a guest, and a lot of them are pretty high-profile guests, a lot of people from Hollywood and things like that, will take a look at a Stephen King book and a film adaptation of that book. So, like, for example, I listened to an episode today where it was uh, Karin Kusama, who is the director of Jennifer's Body and The Invitation. They were looking at Carrie both the uh, original De Palma film and the book. So, you know, it's it's really cool. If you're a Stephen King fan, uh, which uh, I definitely am, definitely worth checking out. It's very well done, very good discussion, really uh, brings a lot to the table. It It's definitely like a, a podcast that would be like a dream for me to, to, you know, do a guest spot on. How about you? Well, one of my favorite things to come out of Netflix in the last few years was The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. For a lover of the occult and demons and Satanism, this was right up my alley, and I love the show until the fourth season. I just finished the fourth season of Sabrina, and they bring in Eldritch Horrors, which was a really fun idea, but man, do they just light the show on fire and watch it burn. Oh, it was tragic. The ending, it was a dumpster fire. It's one of those seasons that it just does not exist in your personal canon. The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina has three seasons, not four. Made me mad. 
I only had one other thing on the docket to talk about, specifically that another show that we uh, have done some, some cool stuff with previously, Knowing My Nightmares, is uh, just beginning their second season of podcasting. Uh, they, uh, Char- Charlie, the, the host, has, has taken about like a year break from doing the podcast and just dropped the first episode of his second season. So I just wanted to highlight that. You know, make sure that that's something on your radar, everybody. Charlie is not only an incredible podcaster and friend of the show, but he's such a cool guy, and his stories are crazy. Definitely check out the podcast. I love it. I keep very current with all of his episodes, and I'm very excited to see this second season come to fruition. Um, anything else we have to talk about, or...? I don't think so, Nathaniel. I think everyone should just probably stay spooky. Stay spooky. Need even more Scream Kings? Here's our obligatory shameless social media plug. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Scream Kings Pod. You could also email us at ScreamKingsPodcast at gmail.com. Help us reach a wider audience of horror fans by leaving a review on iTunes or by sharing a link on social media. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash Scream Kings. Stay spooky.